Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on logic, philosophy, and the super useful syllogistic diagrams of Venn. The circles you may or may not be familiar with, and you can find many, many fine examples online, as well as more talks from myself. So, I have been covering Lewis Carroll a lot, and there is going to be some Carroll in the rest of what I'm going to do for logic, because I do like using Carroll's work so much and find so much in it. So, what we are doing now is we are going to move on while also commenting on Carroll's diagrams and games of logic a little bit. I'm going to save that for other videos about Carroll, primarily, uh, about that primarily. We're going to get into Venn and more of the history of logic. Venn was coming up with circles, and Lewis Carroll, in his work, his... I would have to look exactly where, but I do know by his system of logic, his later work on logic, he was well aware of Venn and discusses him in that work. I don't think he discusses Venn in his game of logic, but I do know he discusses it in his later work on the system of, in, on logic, the system of logic. So let's get to Venn and back to the history of logic and we'll recover Carroll as we need to. So, uh, we have covered Mill, De Morgan, Boole, and Carroll just recently. British logicians who were trying to work with symbolic algebras, not Mill so much, but the rest a bit, and Carroll increasingly in his later work from the game of logic, which is more Aristotelian, to his system of logic, which is more, I would say, De Morgan, Boole, and more mathematical and systematic and formal that they were working on more symbolic formal algebras for systematizing logic and moves of thought, the laws of thought, as Boole called them, in the years before Venn, Piano, Frege, and Russell, and those are the folks we're going to turn to now, founded formal logic on Boolean operations, mathematical-looking operations, symbolized, thus looking, with various but somewhat developmentally consistent notation and practices. Formal logic did eventually settle into a form we teach in classrooms today a bit. It actually is a bit variable in how you can uh, not do it, but how you can symbolize it. And I mentioned that and use symbols found commonly on the keyboard rather than more specific symbols because that makes it more accessible for everyone to type and deal with. But you won't have to type much formal logic with me, I can assure you, outside of my formal logic assignments because I am interested in the insights that all these logicians are having about what is happening for the first time ever at this time known as psychology also. What is the inner joystick of the mind if or if there are not rules? So with all of that, and that all I am very interested in, we are getting into the folks that are presenting logic visually as games and diagrams like Carol and Venn, and then into folks more Boolean than Bool, Boolean onward. So, symbolic notation of very strict sorts is used in textbooks, and there are still widely differing interpretations of nearly unified practices of what we know as systems and teachable basic formal logic of ways of using symbols in the same ways as everyone else, much as one does arithmetic. So it appears that we have, I must say merely appears, that we have something like an arithmetic of logic that is basic formal logic. Now I teach my students, and in this class of the playlist larger, I teach my students how to do that kind of math, but I put it in historical context, and that is what I say from the beginning. And then it can be formal or psychology for you or art or what have you. But what was a pastime in this time for philosophers and mathematicians, very much like a lot of hard science was very much people playing around who could afford to in their attic or tower of weird sorts or what have you is, what was logic for Boole and then he died in obscurity and was trying to make thought into math isn't this fun for a few folks like Carroll, who's an amateur photographer of sorts, and is also doing logic of sorts in his time. He is also, of course, employed not as a photographer, but as a mathematician. And so a logician of the Aristotelian sort is what was a pastime for philosophers and mathematicians in the aristocratic Islamic and Christian worlds 
Judeo-Christian, Abrahamic world, Islamic, all of it, following Aristotle, as I have detailed some of, I still have to flesh out the Islamic and medieval European lectures, but I have to return to some sources I promised I would look over uh, before I do that, and that will come soon. That the Boolean mathematical logic took over, and it's based on the four forms of proposition of Aristotle and then the syllogisms that follow from those four forms and the forms of argument that follow from them most perfectly as mathematical operations. But those Boolean semi-Aristotelian foundations became the foundation for the entire electronic world, with logic gates controlling increasingly complicated circuits of information, which almost becomes thus automated very much magic. Again, I do believe that the Greeks, uh, the word the magi, like those who visited the baby Jesus, is are for the Greeks, folks who may or may not, as the Persians have technology, the Greeks may or may not understand, and so they have the magi have magic. But that, again, may just be like a magic show. It's a form of technology you don't understand, and thus it's magic to the natives or not, yes? So all of us see things as magical that we simply don't understand. It's not necessarily that there are or are not things unexplainable there, or simply alien to ourselves. So the forms of communication and debate that Gautama, Aristotle, and Gongsung Long of India, Greece, and China, respectively, debated about are intelligible and meaningful to us, and we can use them to communicate. But that's all agreed upon by ever, I would, by me, by many. But our devices, the phone you likely carry, and the computer I'm using, also use these forms as systematic co-operations. They're operating along lines that somewhat conform to the contours of how we think. If we want to say formal logic, that Boole was simply successful, and his laws of thought are the laws of thought. Now, that is not my Boole lecture. It's not, uh, and it's not my belief that Boole was simply correct about these things and simply hit bedrock here. That's a very Wittgensteinian, but I'll leave that for later. That there's, that we know that we can meaningfully communicate, but computers and telephone systems use these logical operations in a simplified mathematical form to do a lot that's automated that we're not aware of. And as you can see from how I'm saying it, when computers think a lot, that is metaphorical, and that many people would not think the computer is conscious or really cares. It would have to be programmed to care, or something like that. And we'll just leave that wide open, and I'm not going to get into Turing. But uh, many would question whether or not computer operations or telephone systems are meaningful systems of communication to the devices themselves. Certainly they can pass meaning along through the phone between you and your aunt, you know, Griselda, but it's that doesn't mean the phone knows anything, of course. Alan Turing's followers, not necessarily Alan Turing, and he's an interesting character I have not had time to explain at all, and in fact have not had a chance to delve deep into. But Alan Turing, uh, the Turing test is, if something can behave enough like a human being, you may as well treat it as a human being. Now, Alan Turing's followers claimed light switches thus, who took his thinking a little farther than he did, I believe, said light switches understand two things, on and off, Though many wouldn't agree, and I don't agree, because we don't commonly think of a light switch feeling anything about being on and off, so we associate feeling and consciousness with understanding, and quite simply, I wouldn't need to get into more of an argument than most people, like myself, don't figure light switches think about anything. I think many people would consider whether or not dogs and cats think about things and to what degree, but do not consider a light switch feeling bad about anything. So a light switch does not understand its position and would not feel bad about callously, would feel more about ruining someone's light switch about that person's feelings than the light switch, although that gets ambiguous and interesting. But to Turing's credit, he, in doing the Turing test, did not, and this is somewhat the Detroit video game that I'm not going to get into, I think that people, you know, play and think about, that's uh, in which robots are essentially treated in the back of the bus uh, like American history a la uh, Jim Crow, very openly in that video game. That Turing did not want to live in a world where human beings would treat creatures that can imitate human beings cruelly. So much as Schopenhauer said that uh, he who treats animals poorly cannot be a good man, Turing would be saying a la Schopenhauer-ish, I don't know how much he knew Schopenhauer at all, but he would say he who mistreats a robot, he or she or they, yes, we're being inclusive, 
who treat robots poorly cannot be good people. Turing did not de, uh, Turing did not necessarily mean robots are conscious if they can imitate humans. That's an important point to bring up because people blend that over into later Turing followers thinking, which more supports like, you may as well treat it as conscious, which is what Turing was saying, but he didn't mean we know your computer's conscious. We mean you may as well be nice to your computer insofar as it imitates a human being because what would that say about you and how you interact with your world and others and yourself even, and you have to take your head everywhere with you. If you treat robots that imitate dogs and human beings cruelly and kick them all the time, that's probably bad behavior to model for children, etc. So that is what Turing was saying. Not that we know that computers are sentient when they can imitate us. We should treat them as if they are sentient. It's a strange sort of extension of the golden circuit and rule here. So with all of that, that's more utilitarian. It would be a good ethical position and best to do that to robots. Do them little apparent harm if they imitate actors and mimes, etc., and not beat them. But yes, that is, of course, I don't know, that's not a bad suggestion. I mean, but debating that is, of course, not what we're about right now, but bringing it up is interesting. This is because... We're still here in the intersection of whether or not diagrams and math are living forms or whether or not that uh, a bit falsifies the situation. Yes? So in his first book, The System of Objects, 1968, the French postmodern philosopher and sociologist Baudrillard says there are functional, non-functional, and metafunctional objects. That means there's useful, sub-useful, and super-useful things. He doesn't say those, but we could sub in, yeah sub in sub useful and super useful things and that doesn't mean bad or good in fact sub useful things are wonderful things that surround us uh that intertwine with our lives and he says that order us and them like your phone orders you and you order a new phone if you break it so a hammer is useful and is simply a useful device and he describes this and it's an interesting later kind of nietzsche and heideggerian french uh french idea a hammer, and a hammer is very Heidegger, which is why either I or he, I think he, used this example. I wrote this a little bit ago. A hammer is useful because we use it to hammer in nails. So it has a use, you use it, and then there it is. But there's sub and super useful things a bit more or less than the hammer. And that's not value judging because everything has its place. Think about art and how it's not really useful, but it's an experience and you enjoy it. I uh, was at a museum today with family. The, uh, that a, uh, much love, again. The, that a art is in a certain sense sub-useful. A glass of wine enjoyed in a sunset is in a certain sense sub-useful because you're not doing anything immediate for a purpose right then. And super useful things would be like a hammer that's a, a Swiss army knife that's useful for all kinds of things like a cell phone or something like that. It's a super hammer. Yes, because it's useful for a lot. Now, that doesn't mean a, ha a phone is necessarily better that minute than a glass of wine. You know, I'm teaching students. I mean, if you're elder, you know, if you're your elders and not yourselves. The, of course, with all of this, I mean like art, enjoying anything where you relax into an experience is sub-useful, but that's not bad. It depends, again, on what you need right that minute. And if you're sitting around relaxing, looking at art when you need to be up and going, well, then that's sub-useful in another way, you know. So, as in not so much to you and your likings and dislikings. But in all of that, a beautiful painting thus, um, that is sub-useful. And so we use it more for the immediate moment and enjoyment with little thought of how it will be useful in the future or to this or that in particular. And so the super useful and metafunctional, as Baudrillard says, are useful for more than one thing, like writing, mathematics, government, science, religion, telephones, electronics, computers, or the internet. And he, I believe, passed in, in the uh, mid-2000s, and so he was quite aware of computers and uh, Coriel, email, what have you, Gesundheit, and the internet. These things like smartphones that many carry around in the world are useful for all kinds of things, for enjoyment. And think about how the phone is actually almost super, super useful because we use it for distraction and entertainment as well as coordination. Dating apps that figure out how you may or may not have children ever are super, super interwoven and throughout your life useful. Uh, so basically if you're using your phone for entertainment and you're also using your phone for super coordinating your life, you have it for years, it super, super coordinates your life in ways you're not even paying attention to that you're naturalized to. Yes, 
And here I am not value judging. This has nothing to do with whether or not this freaks Heidegger or Baudrillard out about more or less phones or Tokyo in our life. It doesn't, although they're concerned with that, but that's a completely side issue. That we're just talking about the super and the sub-useful, and that really this could fit into life in many different ways. Obviously, this is there's ethical and social angles here that we're all too familiar with, each of us, but I'm not getting judgy about that and into that right here, am I? So, but between, say, the painting and the smartphone here, we have not only the sub-useful, but the super and the super, super useful, because the you could gaze at paintings for hours on your smartphone and then turn back to the apps for coordinating your moment-by-moment -moment life. And, of course, this does have to do with themes of commodity, acceleration, centralization, all sorts of things that people are concerned about. So logic, including Aristotle's Organon, which is a collection of the texts of Aristotle about logic, is a sort of super useful text. As are his four for, uh, perfect forms of syllogism, the four forms of proposition leading to four perfect forms of argument, according to Aristotle. Technically, again, it's one form with four parts, but that is sort of four forms in that there are four parts each of the form. And each differently formed from the others, of course, in being four separate uh, coordinated parts. So... We're, we're going to consider these four forms again. I'm just going to list them off with examples I cobbled together from Carol, not trying to say those are secrets underlying, but just the, uh, one of them I'm proud of uh, looking at. But the others are just arranged by me as best I can before getting into Venn here. So Venn diagrams are still the best visual way to teach Aristotle's syllogisms. They have problems. They're not perfect. But we don't use Carroll's methods, we use Venn's. And unfortunately, Carroll was comparing his methods to Venn's in his later logic work. I think knowing a bit that Venn had somehow come up with circles, something better and more and simpler for the same audience Carroll himself was trying to help. So there you have it. So, but like Carroll, it's a counting board of sorts as a diagram that shows where this or that is or where this or that leads in thought and logic. So with Aristotle, there are four forms, as covered in the Aristotle, of syllogism, four forms of argument that are the perfect airtight forms of argument. There's Barbara, Celerant, Dari, and Ferio. Barbara is the positive universal syllogism. If all A is B and all B is C, then all A is C. And in Venn diagrams, which I mentioned at the time, if you have a giant circle C within that B and within that A, if all A is inside of B is in the B container, and if all B is in the C container, it's interesting to think about how this is and is not spatial in child and adult reasoning, which is the kind of Wittgensteinian stuff I like, and we will get to a bit. We're not going to flesh it out entirely, because who can? Or who has? But if you think to yourself, just to ham hand a white queen example here with Alice, if you shut your eyes uh, and try very hard, and if all impossible things are in, uh, are things indeed, even if they unicorns and we are all quite mental, then Alice can think of six more impossible things before breakfast if she shuts her eyes, imagines, and tries very hard. We, in many, many different ways, chain all sorts of things together, where if A leads to B and B leads to C, well, then A leads to C. And if these possibilities are in these possibilities or in these possibilities, well, then, once we have A, we have B, we have C. The celerant, the negative universal syllogism, if all A is B and no B is C, then no A is C. If all ways are mine, as the Red Queen says, this one I think is most clearly in the text. Because I believe the Red Queen of the Looking Glass is very much none, like the, uh, and no X is Y, very much the negative universal of that uh, corner of Aristotle, and the Red Queen tells Alice, when Alice says, I wonder which of these ways are mine, the Queen says, all these ways are mine. Now, what does that imply? Well, according to the negative universal syllogism, if all ways are mine and none of what's mine is yours, well, you can assume, and I think we do think along these lines, then none of these ways are yours is what the Red Queen is saying when she says, all, way, all these ways are mine, against Alice saying, which is my way. The Red Queen means, but she doesn't say. 
which is a great play with meaning and saying and logic, which we understand and infer quite syllogistically from what is given in her words, like a puzzle and an answer. As a Venn diagram, if A is entirely in B, and C is a separate container from B, A is in B, but C is over here and not with B, or overlapping with it at all, because there's a none and a divide, then we know A also is not at all overlapping with C. Again, it is very interesting to think about these in terms of uh, child behavior psychology and what is, and I will present, uh, again, increasingly what I think, um, as best I can. I don't think I have final answers, but I think Wittgenstein does supply us with and Poe, Carroll, and the thinkers I like. Answers that suggest words interwoven with motives and feelings are very much how thinking works. And this is what many of the ancient logicians, if you've been watching my videos on logic, have covered and trying to get to the heart of what many would call psychology and I simply call thought. But there's so much more, of course, to say, so let's go onward. Dari, the positive particular syllogism, if some A is B and all B is C, then some A is C. Now what that is, if some A is B, if B, A and B overlap, and you can check the diagram for that, if A and B overlap and all B is C, so all of B is inside C, then you can see with the circular diagrams that some A has to be C because the part of A and B that overlap are also necessarily a part of A that's and C that overlap. If the White Queen, uh, I'm sorry, so just to slap it together here, I believe the White King is a uh, positive particular, some uh, positive some and some. If the White King says he sent almost all his horses along with his men, but not two of them who were needed in the game later, and if Alice has met the, all the thousands that were sent, 4,207 precisely who pass along her way, then Alice has met some but not all, of the horses, namely the, wet and uh, the red and white knights who stand between Alice and the final square where she becomes a queen. As a Venn diagram, if some A is B and all B is C, then some A must be C. So she has met some, but not all. Like, she knows that she has met some, but she does, and this is elementary, of course, reasoning and, uh, well, yes, the putting of uh, each and every slight piece together. So finally here, we have Ferio, the negative particular syllogism. If some A is B and no B is C, then some A is not C. If all things are dreams, as Tweedledum and Tweedledee tell Alice, and some dreams are untrue or not ours alone, then all things are somewhat untrue and somewhat not ours alone. Which seems to be the situation a bit of Tweedledum, D, and the Red King dreaming silently and what they imply, but they don't entirely say and what they tell Alice confusingly about the Red King's dream. We don't learn from what they say that Alice is or isn't real and the Red King is or isn't real, although they suggested at one point. What a lot of what they're saying suggests is that they're not going to be able to show Alice which one of some and some is real or which if she's in the King's dream or he's in hers. And what that does mean, and it does match up, as Aristotle says, if we only have some and no all or none, just some, some, and some, we cannot draw any positive conclusions at all. We just know some C is not, some A is not C, and then we, that doesn't tell us much of anything determinately. And of course, with Aristotle and most, uh, well, most human thought, you want to nail something down decently in situations. That is a heavy emphasis, not just leave everything completely open. Although that is the backs and forths of it, of course, as we've already seen a lot. So the Red King silently dreams and he says nothing to Alice as after she happily dances around hand in hand with both of uh, the twin brothers and the, tw the Tweedles. And again, with some, some, and some, you get nowhere, actually, which I do think Carol's implying in that. So let's move here to Ven and his life and his intersecting circles. Now, Again, actually, in what we've already talked through, which I just covered again, I've already been supplying the Venn. So, in fact, I'm just going to talk a bit about his life and how he's interconnected historically to others. We just covered the basics of Venn diagrams right there. And if you need examples, they are on my website, my notes, and also they're just all over the place, those same diagrams. So let's cover the bit about uh, Venn's life here, because we actually did Aristotle and Carol that relates to him, and because he is so useful with his Venn diagrams and circles, I've been using them to describe Aristotle and Carol all along, which we just recovered. So, John Venn, who lived from 1834 to 1923, was born near Hull on the East Coast, possibly near the Keel. On the East Coast of England, lectured in moral sciences at Caius College, 
teaching philosophy, ethics, and logic. Intersection of logic and ethics. Uh, again, he wrote The Logic of Chance in 1866, Symbolic Logic in 1881, The Principles of Empirical or Inductive Logic in 1889, and developed the Venn Diagrams in 1880 as a method for teaching logic in intercollegiate programs to students of all majors. The diagrammatical device of representing propositions by inclusive and exclusive circles, quote unquote. So actually, just to mention, Lewis Carroll wrote uh, Alice in Wonderland in 1865, I believe. Again, I sometimes am one year off or so and my date's much love. The, uh, and he was writing Wonderland, Looking Glass, Snark, and his works on logic in the years between, uh, well, just around and overlapping entirely with this period in the mid-late 1800s. So the tree of porphyry, porphyry uh, was used in medieval Europe to teach Aristotelian syllogisms with an A branching into B and C, etc. So it can teach the first two perfect universal s forms showing with a branching tree structure, showing that D is B and B is A, so D is A, and that B is A, B isn't C, and so C is an A. And you can, again, attempt to follow that in the medieval diagram. Leibniz was one of the first modern European logicians to study logical diagrams in particular as far as is recorded, but only a small portion of this was published and preserved during his lifetime. So Leibniz did not find it that important to diagram out this, uh, all of this with pictures. The Swith, the Swith, the, and the deadly, the Swiss mathematician Leonor, uh, Leonhard Euler, Euler, 1707 to 1783 had earlier used uh, than Venn between Leibniz and Venn had used circles to diagram propositions such as all B is A and some A is not B such as boats including sailing boats but more than just sailing boats some A is not B and showed one circle inside another so in other words the Sw uh, Euler actually did have basic circular diagrams like Venn and some of the early that his work does overlap with Venn's in creating circular diagrams for this. But Euler diagrams did not show more than one proposition consistent or complementary with another, but rather they just aided visualizing one thing at a time and not all of them. And the French logician and mathematician Joseph Diaz uh, Gergonne, from, who lived from 1771 to 1859, studied how circular diagrams could then increasingly, after Euler, show substructures of syllogisms with two circles relating in five ways, apart, overlapping, identical, one and the other, or vice versa. So all of that then is work that Venn could study, and it isn't so much of a step, in fact, but it was, to take these earlier works and then turn them into what we know and pervasively use as Venn diagrams. Now, Venn realized the circles can intersect and, the base, and some of these guys, by the way, Euler and uh, Gergone, they didn't always use circles. Sometimes they used circles, squares, and triangles, which is really interesting. Think about that. And, of course, here you could represent one group as a circle and one as a square merely to distinguish the two visually rather than say anything about, like, the shape of the thing, of course. But Venn consistently uses mere, only circles, merely circles, perhaps. It's judgy, isn't it? So... Venn realized that the circles can intersect and the basic syllogisms and forms of logic can all thus, in a way, be represented each, not perfectly, but in a way, in a definite way, with a small number of these circular diagrams such that it clicked into the Venn out of those previous thinkers. So, for example, you take two intersecting circles, like the Katascoti of Nagarjuna, Four regions, A, B, A, and B, and neither A nor B. So if we want to say that all A, B is A, but some A is not B, we can cross out or fill in the B region. And this is very much like Carroll, leaving us no B that is not A, but some A that is not B. For three classes and all the ways they can intersect, Venn placed three circles sharing part in the middle. The German... Mathematician Mich, I hope I'm saying that right, had created a similar three circles just before. 
1871, and Venn drew on his work, but Meek did not, Meek Gesundheit, did not see how he could use all the intersecting spaces, merely some of them ignoring other unused sections. Which is kind of sad, because a lot of these folks got very close to what Venn's like, hey, look at this. And funny enough, as we'll get to here, Venn was not actually trying to be a highly, uh, high, uh, simply appealing to experts as he did this. Venn carefully surveyed all the work of those before him more than anyone, and he based his on the algebra cl of classes, uh, the algebra of classes of Boole. Venn's absence of a universal class was a bit of an embarrassment for other logicians. So Venn says the limits of discourse are, quote, whatever I choose to consider them, end quote, and may cover a sheet of paper or contained in a larger drawn circle or go off indefinitely. Carroll said he was astonished that Venn allowed the fourth subset, the rest of the infinite plane, anything outside of the diagrams and the circles is just everything else. And other logicians would feel it weird that everything outside of A, B, and C in those circles just goes on forever undefined, actually, is what we're talking about. But Venn's just like, nah, it could be the edge of the paper or anything I say it is at the time. Carroll has a lot in his work that suggests he also thinks, hey, it's whatever we say it is because that's the game we're playing with what we're doing. But he also says Venn decides to set it permanently as if, and he says, I did not give it such liberal sway to say that the universe of discourse is just open-ended and unending. He says, I gave it strict limits in my game of logic to compare himself with Venn, and Venn actually won out in that just what's not A, B, and C just goes on forever in a very unreserved way, you know? So Carroll said he's astonished that Venn allowed the fourth subset, the what's not A or not B or not C, the rest of the infinite plane to range about in, home on the range, and Carroll's logical diagram method closes the area, he says himself, he closes what Mr. Venn allows liberal sway, but he is now dismayed, he says, to find it's... Uh, but what the, that the way itself, talking about the sections of logic as if the logic itself is characters and has feelings, that what it's all out there is not defined as A, B, or C is now dismayed itself, this strange sort of nothingness, everythingness, to find itself cabined and confined in a limited cell like the other classes. The undefined is now just in its own cabin, as opposed to being in the infinite sea stretching off into the distance. So that's Carroll's criticism of Venn. What's not in the circles goes on forever. What the heck's this guy's problem? Notice we just ignore that. Like we ignore how many times a circle goes around when we're like four. So Venn wrote that Boole's work is not so much reducing logic to mathematics, but enumerating and symbolizing general logical processes, actualities, and probabilities, such as dichotomy and subdivision with symbols, and the circular diagrams can serve the same purpose. In binary, which is how Boolean algebra is done in the basis of computing systems, there are zeros or ones for each class, so for th circles A, B, and C, you could translate Venn very easily into zero and zero and zero means that's actually, for Carol, the closed set of the range of what is not A, B, and C, zero, zero, zero. One, one, one means all of them. And zero, one, oh, one means A, not B, and C. So you can flip switches with computers and telephone systems and then computers and then the internet to represent all of this without circles. Well, with circles as in zeros. But of course, the machine flipping the switches doesn't care whether what is, what is a circle and what is a line here. They're merely opposed to positions, whether or not it cares. So in the 15th century, these were actually known a bit as the Baromian rings also that symbolize the Christian trinity uh, found in the crest of the Baromian family of northern Italy is also a bit of an ancient medieval precedent. As people point out, Lewis Carroll was Venn's double a bit at Oxford, where he tried to represent the universal class as a closed area, as we've said here, of rectangles rather than an open area with circles writing in his symbolic logic that his diagrams resemble Venn's, and he also marks the parts as occupied or empty, but with a closed area that places the infinite space in a single compartment. Carroll presented his diagrams in 1887 in The Game of Logic, over 20 years after Venn published his original work on this. So 
Yes, I was again, forgetting for a moment whether or not Carol discusses Venn in both his works on logic, the game of logic, and then symbolic logic, he does discuss Venn in both. It turns out, thank you, former me. Venn gave up uh, at four categories in his original idea, but Carroll actually adapted his to take eight uh, dimensions or more, given the areas are broken up into non-continuous parts, such that A and B areas are, occur in different places apart. Much later, the mathematician Edwards figured out that drawing the circles as cogwheels allows many more to fit together simply. So, uh, yes, what I would, uh, well, I have an image here uh, for in, in my website notes, which you can follow along with my talks uh, with. There's a couple of widths there quite additive. And you can look up Edwards and cogwheels uh, in Google Image or an image search and find that um, and see the cogwheels within cogwheels and how you can continue to make tinier and tinier cogwheeled circles to represent what is and isn't. It's a bit, uh, well, yes, a bit like Mandelbrot. Plenty. So Lewis Carroll had Venn's works Though Venn's diagrams were developed after both Alice's books were completed, so Carol could not have used Venn's diagrams to plan or plot out either of Alice's adventures, necessarily. But as he was struggling to create a square-shaped counting board method, that vision... It, looking Glass, actually... Looking Glass may have been, actually. Um, but I would think that Carol is sticking to his own, again, uh, well, yeah, counting board kind of method and is developing that whether or not he is reading Venn at the time. Um, but he was... Al <laughs> Carol was struggling to basically create this into squares as he is then writing Looking Glass. The Wonderland was completed, but Looking Glass with the squares and the chessboard, which is more his style, was completed in the years just after this. Um, so, yes... Venn's diagrams, though, were quickly becoming the standard for teaching syllogisms and Boolean operations, much as Boolean operations later became the standard for electronic circuits. And I do believe Carol mocks Bool a bit at the Mad Tea Party, and then uh, Venn takes up Bool and creates a more popular set of diagrams than Carol. So it's arguable that Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass are themselves visual presentations of logical forms, but different from Venn's and trying to compete with people like Venn at the time. Uh, whenever Carol did learn of and then own Venn's work, which he did at some point. So yes, that is my talk here on Venn, Venn diagrams, and interlacing that with the talks on Carol and the works of Alice. So we're going to continue on here with more lectures on logic. I'm going to continue with a piece on, a small, tiny piece on what uh, is important for some of what we're going on to about piano and uh, set theory. And then I'm going to have a talk about Frege. Um, and I uh, had good classes with Hans Sluga here in Berkeley Town. Barkley, etc. And with all of that and the idealism, I definitely have Wittgensteinian ideas about how Frege is doing things with logic that Russell does, that early Wittgenstein does, that later Wittgenstein doesn't. And we're going to be talking through a lot of that, and I want to get some of those talks online in the wake of the talks on Carol especially. So, piano and onward. So, much love, much happiness. Again, many fine moves of logic and motive, etc. And I shall see you if and when I ever do see you.